Good morning, church. You know, it's so good to see our church this morning is almost packed to the full, you know. And it's just an ordinary service. Let's give a big hand to the Lord. Amen. Uh, this morning, I want to share with you on the topic of the church. Since we are going to have our AGM this afternoon, we are going to talk about the business of CGBC. So it is uh, suitable that this morning, uh, let me just share with you, what do we expect of a church, you know, the destiny of the church while we are on earth. Amen? Before I do that, shall we just pray? Father, I want to thank you this morning. Thank you for the assembly of your people. Lord, we are gathered here because we want to praise, to worship, and to honor you. We want to thank you, Lord, for all the hearts this morning that are inclined towards you. And we want to, Lord, uh, once again, remind ourselves what you have done for each one of us, how you have turned our destiny from hopelessness into hope, how you have changed each one of us from sinners into saints, that today we are a people that are an example of what heaven is like on earth. So Father, I pray that this morning, as we go into your word and begin to discover it further, one more time, who we are while we are on earth, we ask the Holy Spirit to help each one of us, to enlighten our heart and our mind as to what our destiny is while we are still on earth. Help us, Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, what is the church? The church, as we know, it is a people that has been called out of the world and gathered into a community. The word that is uh, being used actually in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, it is called Ecclesia. Ecclesia is a redeemed community. This morning, I would really... I uh, want to share on the part of every one of us. Uh, you see, first of all, the church since its birth uh, almost 2,000 years ago on earth, and it will continue to exist on earth at least until the Lord returns. Amen. But while the, the church has such a long lifespan on earth, but each one of us will only be a part of it only while we are still on earth. Unless you expect yourself to live for longevity on earth, in a hundred and perhaps thousands of years, that is not uh, the fact. It's not the reality. Each one of us will only play a part of the church, you know, perhaps for, you know, some who came to know the Lord very late into their life, perhaps 10 years, some 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. But nonetheless, you know, we will only exist as a part of the church while we are on earth. So while we are existing now on earth, you know, what is our role? What do you expect from each one of us? So this morning, I find it suitable to just uh, recall from the word and uh, remind each one of ourselves what is expected of us while we are on earth. Amen? Now, I would like to use three words uh, to help us to describe ourselves. This three word is first of all reproduce. Can everybody say reproduce? And when I say reproduce, I don't mean just like preparing another generation to take over us when we are gone. I mean more than that. What I meant is, you know, we are already an existing uh, group of people that is put on earth by God. But God is going to recreate another group of people out of the existing group of people who are living on earth. Reproduce out of what is existing. That's my meaning, alright? First word, reproduce. The second word is retrain from the original word train. Retrain. And the third word is recolonize. Okay, where do I find this in the Bible? Very quickly, alright, just to convince you, this is not just my word, but really is from the word of God. Now, Peter calls the church, calls the ecclesia, 
you know, a very peculiar type of people on earth. You know, tell your neighbor we are not normal one. You know, compared to other people on earth, we are very special. This is how you know Peter described us in First Peter chapter two verse nine. Just listen to me, all right? But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. We are called out people, all right? From already an existing human race. We are called out from them, all right? We are chosen and this is the word I summarize it into, reproduce. God is going to reproduce another human race out of the existing human race on earth. Alright, amen? Then number two reference is with regard to retrain. God is going to retrain this reproduce group of people called the church. Where do we find that in the Bible? It is in Romans Chapter 8, verse 29. Okay, very quickly, allow me to read it with you. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those called for new, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. You see, this reproduced group of people by God on earth, God is going to conform them to the likeness of Jesus Christ. That means God is going to retrain each one of us. All right, We have already been trained in life uh, as to how to live. But God is going to retrain every one of us. All right, That's why I use the word retrain. Second word. The third word, recolonize, I found it in Luke chapter 12, verses 32. You see, Luke says in here, Chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus told the disciples, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. You see, God is very pleased. In fact, you know, it makes Him so happy that He has got something wonderful, you know, to pass it on to you and to me. The redeemed, the reproduced, and the retrained group of people. You know, God has put at first, uh, as we read it from Genesis, God has put us on earth, a group of people that was created by Him. We were meant to colonize, to take control of everything on earth. But that plan did not work out too well. We all know that. So God is going to recreate another group, retrain them, and this time God is going to use this group of people to recolonize the earth once again. Tell your neighbor, that is you and me. God is going to use us to recolonize the earth so that we may take dominion of what God has already made for you and for me. Alright? Three words. Can we all say these three together so that you and me can remember it very well? Reproduce, retrain, and recolonize. Amen. Now I can draw you to the Bible passage that I have chosen to share with you this morning. Alright? It is found in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 19. In the Gospel, alright? Not in the New Testament. In the Gospel, the word church will only mention three times. Surprising, right? Okay? And all three times were mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew. First time was mentioned here. Chapter 16. And the other two times were mentioned in chapter 18. Those two times were with, with regard to church discipline. Alright, we won't touch on that. We will touch on this one. The first time when Jesus talked about the church. Alright, allow me to read it with you again. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they say, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, and one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, 
You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Pay attention to this verse 13, because I would like to emphasize on this verse. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. First time church is mentioned by the Lord. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now when we read this passage, Perhaps you have, you have been taught and many have preached on this passage before and I myself have done it many times. The emphasis we mentioned here was the importance of the disciples that they have to discover, they have to really know who Jesus is first before Jesus can proceed on to build the church, to birth forth the church. All right, That knowledge of who Jesus is is vital. But I see in this passage another significance, which perhaps many of us have missed out. All right, why do I say that? You see, Jesus has never mentioned about the church, you know, until the disciples were ready. First of all, they must know who he is first. But there is another very significant aspect that the Lord wants to have some confirmation from the disciples, from the people. Now, let me just, uh, you see in John, this is not the, the first passage that the disciples have some idea who Jesus is. Actually, if you read John, even right in the first chapter, when Jesus was calling the disciples, Andrew, remember Andrew was one of the twelve, he already had some idea of who Jesus was. You know, I did not put it on the board. Andrew actually called his brother, that is Simon Barjona here, or Simon Peter. He said, Simon, please come with me. We have found the Messiah. John chapter 1. You see, right in the beginning, the disciples already have some idea who Jesus was, that he is the Christ. Andrew called Simon to come because he thinks that Jesus is the Christ. All right? So this is actually not the first time the disciples discovered. But earlier on, they were not very convinced. So Jesus had to ask them again to be really sure this time that they know who He is. But there is another point, vitally important. You see, immediately Jesus told Simon, the fact that you know who I am, it is not because of your wisdom. Neither because you are very knowledgeable. Because by man, no man can know who He really is. The fact that Peter, you know who I am, that you can declare that I am the Christ, it is because the Father has revealed it to you and the fact that now you can declare who I am shows that, confirm that you have received what the Father has revealed to you. That there is now a communication between the Father and man now. Now this is vitally important. You must remember, the human race has been cut off from God since the very day when our forefathers sinned in Eden. Men no longer have the privilege of communicating, having a close and intimate relationship with God. We have been cut off since those days. But now this is an affirmation. Jesus wants to know for sure that you people are now able to be reconciled to God that God can now speak to you and you can now receive it from God. This is a vitally important point. That's why after Peter's declaration, Jesus says, I can now build my church because my church is built on a relationship with God. If the church does not have a relationship with God, how could the church survive? The church will always so why based on its relationship to God the Father? And Jesus go on to say, Now I am at peace now that you people are now being reconciled with God. I can now birth the church. I can now build my church among you people. But 
Be careful, Jesus says. You know, you are going to have enemies. That's why he told them, the gates of hell, there will be many gates, there will be many roadblocks, there will be many oppositions, many adversaries that is going to stop you. But the gates of hell will never be able to prevail over you. Amen? Remember, don't get too friendly with the world. They are not going to be too happy with you. Alright? You are going to have many adversaries, but rest assured, Jesus told them, you are going to be empowered. You will be given the tool. You will be taught you know, how to overcome all these adversaries on earth. How to God do that? Jesus says, I'm going to give you the access to the kingdom of heaven. Keys to the kingdom of heaven means that you have access. You know, all the resources in heaven are now available to you. That's why you're able to command, you know, an authority, a power on earth that you will be able to overcome your enemies. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. That heaven will do what you say. Heaven will stop what, when you say stop. Heaven will go when you say go. This is what the Lord means, that you now have the keys to heaven. To enable you to overcome the gates of hell, you must have access to heaven. God must be on your side because we need God. Amen? This is in general how we get to know who we are. Jesus says, I'm now ready, you know, to start the church on earth. Before I continue to talk about who we are, because each one of us is go going to play our role, perhaps for, you know, a certain period of time while we are on earth. We have got to know what is expected of us, okay? Now I'm going into it. But before I do that, can I share an example with you first? You see, I like to look at the environment. Sometimes when we look at the environment, it reminds us of who we are. A good example this morning I want to share with you is to talk about what a salmon fish is. How many of you here have not eaten a salmon fish before? Can I see a show of hands? You have never eaten a salmon fish before. Okay, Alan doesn't like salmon. Anybody else? Oh. Adam, you also don't like salmon. I thought it is a good fish. You see, salmon fish, uh, when we fry it uh, or steam it or whatever you do with it, it, it generates a lot of oil. But rest assured, I was told that this oil is good for you. It is not going to increase your cholesterol. In fact, it is good for your health. All right? The salmon oil, correct or not? I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong afterwards. Huh? But salmon is a very special kind of a fish. I don't know whether you realize it or not. Salmon is both a freshwater as well as a saltwater fish. Do you know that? Do you know that? Tell your neighbor. <laughs> this morning I tell you, salmon is very different from other fish. You see, usually, you know, when we have fish, either it is a freshwater fish, you know, it survives its whole life in fresh water, or it is a, a saltwater fish from the sea. But salmon is very special. You know, it begins its life, you know, as a freshwater fish. And it spends the rest of its life, the majority of its life, in the sea, in the ocean. Now, let's begin. Salmon was spawned usually at the upper stream of the river. Alright? So when it is born, when it is birthed, you know, as a fry, it will begin to swim downstream along the river, where it was born. Now, swimming, swimming down the river is easy, all right? Because the river always flow in a, you know, in a downslope gradient, right? While the salmon fish is swimming, you know, towards the sea, its body begins to transform. Bio biologically or physiologically, you call it. You see, to prepare itself when it arrives, you know, at the sea, that its body will be able to adapt to a new environment, you know, the saline environment. So the journey down the river is actually like a form of 
transformation for the fish, for the salmon. So when it arrives at the river mouth and begins to transit into the ocean, it does not stop there. In fact, you know, the journey of life for the salmon just began. It swims and continues to swim, you know, it crossed the sea, crossed the ocean, you know, for hundreds and perhaps even thousands of miles to the other side of the ocean. You know, it will take a bit of a time. It continues to grow, you know, it will beat the storms, it will beat the wind, you know, it will overcome or rather avoid all the predators. You know what I mean? The bigger fish that will eat it, all right? Including, there are many predators here in the church. <laughs> Tell your neighbor you are one of them. You see, only two, two of our people here have not eaten salmon fish. All of us have eaten salmon fish, alright? We are also one of those predators that the salmon have got to avoid, you know? So the salmon has actually performed well, you know, crossed the ocean, and if it is not get caught or eaten by other species, you know, beat the storm and the physical weather, you know, it will reach a time when the salmon will realize that I am of age. I am of age. So the salmon very naturally or rather spontaneously deep within that fish itself it reminds itself I have got to return to where I was born. Now this is something very spontaneous. You see, the salmon don't have to you know, work itself up you know, to conform uh, to what people know of that fish that we have to go back to our spawning place. No. It's very naturally for a salmon. So the salmon begins to reverse its journey and travel once again over hundreds, perhaps even thousands of miles, meeting all the difficulties, challenges, and danger. Its objective is to return back to where it was born. So it crosses the seas and the oceans again, get back into the same river that it came out from and begin now to swim upstream. You know, swimming downstream is easy, right? <laughs> now, that fish have to swim upstream now, going back to the upper reaches of the river. And that is not only the difficulty. If you have watched some documentary, I'm sure you still remember, while the salmon is going swimming back up, there were a lot of bears, a lot of other animals waiting for the fish at the river bank to catch every one of them, to eat. So, you know, they brave all the danger. And also, despite all the difficulty, you know, they have got to jump over certain, uh, you know, rocks, you know, fjords or whatever, the barriers uh, in the river for them to really, you know, swim all the way back to where they originated. So by the time they arrived at where they were born, they were all very exhausted, very tired. Whatever energy that was left in them was just to spawn. You see, the female will release eggs. The male will release the sperm to fertilize the eggs at the river bank, you know, in the upper reaches of the river. And usually, based on what I saw in, on documentary, they will die. You see, as I look at this uh, documentary, I can share the feeling in the salmon as though if they could not return to where they were born and reproduce another generation of a salmon fish fry so that the cycle of the salmon continues when this adult salmon dies off. I feel that if the salmon do not do that, it is somehow like there is a lot of unfulfilled desire in each one of them. You know, like the Chinese says, Sei dong nan bai. They have to go back to reproduce. They have to prepare the next generation you know, for the salmon to continue to exist. Why do I share this story with you? This morning, as I look at the fish, I begin to wonder and ponder, am I looking at myself? Because deep inside myself, I believe it also represents you, that there is a deep desire in each one of us to reproduce. All right, Because we are not going to be here forever. At most, I mean, from the time you become a believer until the time you're going to leave earth, I give you 70 years. Maybe if you can live up to age of 90, at the age of 20, you became a Christian, give you 70 years. You know, these 70 years, you know, at the end of it, 
it will be in every of our desires. Have we left behind, you know, another generation that will take over us when we are gone, when we are not around anymore? This is something that is spontaneous, natural, you know, in the DNA of the salmon. I believe it is also deep inside each one of us. It is inside our nature that we have to reproduce another generation. That speaks about why the church will never die out, you know, since the days of Jesus. We have already been on earth, you know, for almost 2,000 years. And despite the difficulty, you know, I have shared with you, you know, the last time when I was here, you know, to be a Christian is the most difficult religion to be a member. And yet, you know, you, if you look at the world, Christianity is the biggest religion. Even despite all the persecution, the danger, many are still dying to become a born again Christians. And somebody say, Amen. Do you see how God is real? That we don't just read it in the Bible. We can look around us and see in reality the church will survive all the gates of hell. Despite you know, any government you know, trying to stop that faith. Despite any temptations or trials that is going to you know, restrict us. Yet, the church will continue to grow. Amen. Now, we are like the salmon fish. Let us look at the salmon fish and compare to ourselves if you want to really know more about you. Remember just now I mentioned three words. Can I uh, go through with you again? The first words to reproduce. To reproduce, we are talking about evangelism. Deep inside, you know, the blood, the DNA of every Christian is evangelism. It is our life blood. You know, it is always in our desire. To see someone, you know, to come to faith just like you and me. Sometimes we could not explain why. But the word has been so grounded in each one of us. You know, sometimes subconsciously, you know, whenever there is an opportunity that arises, we will always, you know, feel like, is this the right time to talk about Jesus? You know, is this the, the, the best way to share the gospel? You know, it will always occur at the back of our, our mind when we are confronted, you know, with opportunities. Evangelism. Evangelism, remember, it is... Many of us got defeated by this idea is because we think that, you know, the other person would not believe, you know, or now that I've shared with you, this is the role of the Holy Spirit, you know, whether you do or don't do may not matter. No, it does matter. I give you an example. You see, remember, there was a time when Jesus was not far from the disciples. Jesus was at the shore and Peter and the other disciples were coming back after a whole night fishing trip and they were all very disappointed because they caught no fish. But they saw Jesus, you know, at, at, at the, uh, the beach not too far from them and Jesus called up to them and told them to cast their nets. Can you imagine what is in Peter's mind, you know, if I could step in the shoes of Peter, this is how I would think. You know, I have been a fisherman all my life. You know, since I finished, you know, primary school, I have been already in this trade. You know, I know all about fishing. I know all about fishing. My whole life experience is in fishing. And whole night, I caught no fish. Suddenly, this carpenter, my Lord, came and told me to cast my net. What does Jesus know about fishing? Carpenter. Ma. But remember what the, how the story ends. Peter says, just because you say so, even in my mind, I know that I'm not going to catch any fish. But just because, Lord, you say so at your word, I will cast my net. I will push. You know, I will throw my fishing line. Whether there is a fish at the end of the other line or whether there is any fish in the net, thereafter is not important. Peter says, just because you say so, I will cast my net. You see, this is evangelism. Whether you catch any fish or not, don't have to worry. Just trust Jesus. Just obey what He says and you will be surprised. Let me tell you, you are going to be surprised that just like Peter and the disciples, when they hauled up the net, whoa, they could not believe their eyes. 
There were so many fishes. Even the net is about to be torn. I tell you, when you really obey the word of God, you are going to encounter a lot of surprises. I guarantee you, because this is in the word. Just trust Him and you are going to be surprised at the way you think about yourself. At the way we think about the outcome. It is all wrong. Let us just trust Jesus. You know, the way we cast net, it's just to tell stories on Him. The way we evangelize, the way we talk about Jesus, the way we witness, it's just to tell stories. Let me convince you once again. Telling our story is really as simple as ABC. Can everybody say ABC? I tell you, there was a time when Jesus came into the temple. You know, he saw one blind man in the temple and he asked the blind man, do you want to see again? Of course, the blind man said, I want to see again. But whether fortunately or unfortunately, because that day was a Sabbath day. But despite the fact that it was Sabbath, Jesus healed the blind man. Jesus healed the blind man. But the temple authorities were feeling differently about the whole thing. They were so religious. They said, why can't we observe the law? How can we do work on Sabbath, even including healing, doing something good is prohibited on Sabbath? So they came to the, the once blind man and asked him, who did this to you? Who opened up your eyes? You see, listen to what the blind man said. The blind man said, I, I don't know who is the guy that opened my eyes. But what I can tell you is, just now I was blind. But now I can see. Now this is what I can tell you. Now this is our story. This is our testimony that we have to share with people. What kind of a people you were before you know Jesus? Now that you know Jesus, what has you become of? This is our testimony. How God has protected us, how God has provided for us, how God has led us through every breakthrough, how God has healed us, delivered us. There are so many stories that we can tell people. Evangelism is actually very, very easy. Don't give excuses that you need to read through the Bible from front to the back, you know, 10, 20 times. Don't, need, don't have to. Of course, if you have read through it, all the better. It, don't, don't give any excuse that you, you have not been to Bible college, you are not equipped to evangelize. Don't give those excuses. You don't have to go to Bible college. Just tell your story that is needed. Alright? Whether you catch any fish or don't catch any fish, doesn't matter. Just like Peter, what he says, just as your word, we will cast our net. Amen? So this is how we are going to call people out among the people that are in the world. We are going to call them out of darkness into His marvelous light. This is reproducing people from people that are already produced on earth. Amen? Second word, we train. Now, I find this very interesting. As the salmon is, you know, uh, swimming down the river into the sea, his body really began to change. Learning how to adapt to this saline condition. This actually speaks to every Christian. Once you are born again, you will begin the journey of transformation. Now, transformation is a big word. Let us reduce it to a smaller word. It's just changing the way you think first. When we have a paradigm shift, it is enough. Because once you have a paradigm shift, your life will change. Why our life is still the same and not change is because you have not had a paradigm shift in your mind. We have to begin from there. Every transformation in the Bible begins in the mind. Now, why this is so important? We have really got to understand who ourselves is. You see, when God created every one of us, God created a system inside of us. First of all, this system is neutral. It can work for you, it can work against you. This system is whereby our whole life is controlled by our thinking. God made this in each one of us. Whatever controls your mind, controls your life. So it depends now what is controlling your mind. Now, remember, it can work for you, it can work against you. Now that we have all been born again, we have all been born again, our human spirit has come alive. Let me just tell you how this works out in each one of us uh, to enable a paradigm shift. 
You see, now that our human spirit has born alive, we have now got a teacher. We have got someone to guide us now. We have got someone to influence us now. But prior to that, before we were born again, we have got nobody to guide us except the environment. Remember, when our spirit dies in the Garden of Eden, there was nothing in between us and God. God has lost the influence and advisory level over our life. God could not speak to us because we could not hear from Him. Because our spirit has died. But now that our spirit has come alive, it is a totally different ball game. Prior to that, you know, since the day we were born, you know what was teaching us? The environment. You know, giving us a set of values, a set of belief system. You know, true traditions, customary practice, our culture. This has shaped the way we think and because of that, it has shaped the way, you know, our behavioral pattern until, you know, it fixes a habit in each one of us. You see, once we have a habit, we already cannot control ourselves. Your habit will control you. If it is a positive habit, you will have a positive behavior. If you have got a negative habit, you will have a negative behavior. Alright? That was the reason why Paul was sharing in Romans chapter 7 and 8. I have got no time. Please go and read it yourself. Four testimony which I have shared with you before. I can only have time to summarize with you. you. Remember at one time, Paul says, whatever I know that is good, that means whatever good that I want to do, but I can't do it. That is not worse. Whatever the evil that I do not want to do, but I find myself keep on doing it. This is because he has already a different set of values and belief system as opposed to the Word of God. That's why whatever he knows of God, but he will not be able to practice it. Today, we can very easily see it in many of our lives. It's like sometimes when we say, you know, a smoking doctor. Have you seen a doctor who smokes or not? There are some, but of course not all. Huh? There are some. I'm sure you know that doctor knows that smoking is bad for him, right? Or her. But yet the doctor is still smoking. I have some doctor's friend who are smokers, you know. Sometimes I was wondering, how come he knows that it's so bad for his health, but yet he's smoking and puffing away. Huh? You know, it is just like Paul. He knows what is good, but he just cannot do it. When he, what he knows is bad. He doesn't want to do, yet he finds himself doing it. Let me tell you, you know, as we allow God to work in our life, you see, now we have access to God already. Remember just now, I shared with you in the passage 16 here, once we have access with God, our whole life will be totally different. There will now be a communication with God. The Holy Spirit is that means. You will now have God who is going to talk to you. You will have God who is going to guide you. You will have God who is now going to advise you. You will have God who is going to warn you. You have God who is now going to comfort you and encourage you. The communication is now true with God. So the life that we live today is so much different. That's why we can change. You know what happened when we are changed? Of course, I'm only bringing you to the end. It takes our whole lifetime to change from now until the end. You see, when we are transformed, do you know what will happen to us? It is the opposite of what the Apostle Paul shared with us. Remember, the Apostle Paul says, you know, the good that I want to do, but I can't do it. Once you are changed, you know what will happen to you? The evil that you want to do, but you can't do it. You try to cheat, you try to deceive, you know, you try to take advantage of people, you try to kill, you can't do all those things already. Remember, I've shared with you, once God has really convicted you and transformed you, it is not so easily to sin anymore. Many of us still think that to sin is natural. Yes, that is before you are born again. Once you are born again, you can't sin. Because every time when you sin, your conscience will work heavily on you. You will feel so guilty. You will feel so down. You are going to stop at sinning. You see, once you have changed, you know, 
the evil that you want to do, you will not be able to do it. Now, this is a scenario in heaven, I'm guaranteeing you. In heaven, even though you want to sin, you will not be able to sin. You know why? You don't know how to sin anymore. Now, this is just half the aspect. The other aspect, remember what Paul says, the evil that I do not want to do, I keep on doing it. You see, once we are transformed, you know what our target is? Reverse of that. The good that we do not want to do, we find ourselves keep on doing it. Now, many of us are like that one, I'm telling you. Many of us, you know, today, uh, you know we have a problem. We know what is good one, but we don't want to do. To be compassionate, to be forgiving, to be generous, you know, to love. These are all the good things, you know, uh, we do not want to do. And many of us are still refusing to do all these things. But once you are transformed, these good things that you do not want to do, like for example, many of us do not want to evangelize them. But once God transforms you, even if you do not want to evangelize, this is a good thing. You will find yourself evangelizing. Because you have got a new habit that is coming on you. This new habit is going to take control of your life. You see, that fish that are swimming down the river is being transformed. The same goes for all of us. Once we are born again, our journey of transformation in the paradigm shift of our thinking will already begin. As we begin, it will get us ready. It will prepare us to face the world now. Let me go to the third word. The third word is recolonize. You see, once we are being you know, already in the process of being changed and transformed, looking more like Jesus, more and more like Him, we are now ready to represent Him. We are now ready to be His, his ambassador. You see, remember, the salmon fish is not a small fish. It is not a kampong fish. It is not a small river fish. You see, this salmon fish is born, is designed for great things in life. This salmon is going to cross the sea and the ocean. This salmon is going to engage on a global scale, international scale, because it's going to cross the ocean for miles, thousands of miles away. The same like for all of us. Don't underestimate ourselves. Every one of us are born for great things. God has got great things for each one of us. You know, I, I like the way, you know, some of these uh, tour agencies advertise, you know, their program. Uh, you remember, I don't know whether you have come across any one of them. You know, these are the 10 places you have got to visit before you die. Uh, have you come across this advertisement before? Now, these are the things that we have got to experience in life before it goes back to the Lord. You know, we are going to impact societies. We are going to influence the community where we live in. We are going to impact nations, not just our own nation, but the nations of the world. This is the site that God has set for all of us. So don't go back to the Lord before you experience all this. These are all part and parcel of what God has planned for all of us. You know, we have talked about the seven mountains. Remember how we could impact you know, societies, you know, right? in our own nation, in the government, uh, in politics, in the business, in the corporate sector, you know, in the, in the media industries, how we could be part of it and be the influential factor that moves societies, how they think and how they live and how they feel about their life. You know, how we can you know, uh, impact the entertainment industry. This is so important. Because entertainment is so vital to all of us. Every one of us needs to rest. We need a Sabbath. But how we rest in the Lord and recharge ourselves depends what you are being entertained. You know? So we have to have a voice uh, in the entertainment uh, industry. This slowly goes back to, to the way you know, our children, the next generation, are educated in the education uh, field. You know, in the family institution, how we raise up, how we teach, how we mentor, how we groom our children and other people's children. These are all part of the things that we can impact the world. And of course, in the religious sector, how we could share life that is beyond what we can see 
are in the physical. People know that there is life beyond. And they need to know uh, what is the answer to life beyond what is on earth. So we are the ones that are ready to share with them you know, how we could you know, really experience the, the joy, the meaning and the purpose of life. All right? This is how we are going to recolonize. You see, remember earth. Why I use the word colony? The earth is not our home. We have been put here by God in the Genesis story. Please remember that we, this is not our original place. Our original place is with the Father. The Father breathed every one of us into a tent. That tent is our body. That's why this is just a tent. Your real self is your soul, your spirit that God breathed inside of you. You are looking at me from your spirit because your tent, your body will not going to sit here forever. It's going to live here one day. See, God put us here to colonize earth. God put us here since the Genesis story to colonize earth, to take control and to rule and to reign on earth. But we have lost the privileges. You know the reason why. Alright? So, now, God is going to recolonize earth by using His own redeemed community. Again, I'm talking about the church. Again, I'm talking about you and me. Somebody say, Amen. Now, I'm going to end here already. I've shared with you our destiny on earth. Alright? Don't leave home before you experience all this. To reproduce. Just like the salmon. Before the salmon dies, make sure you reproduce somebody to take over your place. To retrain the redeemed community. That person you know, has got to be retrained. Otherwise, he or she cannot impact the world. He or she will not be able to survive in the world. Alright? You look at how many Christians today, you know, you are halfway, you know, one leg in the kingdom of God, one leg still in the kingdom of the world. You find your life Tremendous, tremendously challenged. You find many a times you are defeated, disappointed. You know why? You are not ready. You have to get yourself ready. You have got to have that paradigm shift. Remember, you are prince, you are princes and princesses. You know, you are no longer the slaves or the servants anymore. You have been transformed, you know, from the outside and now into the inside. Of the kingdom of God. Alright? We are born for great things. Now, in CGBC, you know, we plan our program every year. Afterward, we are going to discuss and get your approval, you know, in the afternoon. You know, all of our objectives, plans, and activities are in CGBC. It's focused on these three things. How we could reproduce, retrain, and recolonize societies and nations. How we could go out to evangelize and minister to people so that they are changed and transformed and get ready you know, to impact, impact societies, impact nations. Amen? Have I, have I you know, uh, speak my point clearly enough? If, if I have, can I invite you to stand? Let us just pray. Father, we want to thank you that we have a God who is like you. A God who has great plans for your children. And we thank you today, Lord, we are going to meet as your people to discuss on the kingdom business. How we should go forward from where we are today. How we could fulfill, Lord, your purpose in each one of us. That we may evangelize, that we may, Lord, be the shepherd that minister to your people. So that, Lord, your people will be prepared, equipped and empowered to, and to impact the nations. Father, help CGBC, help all of us here to fulfill the plans and the purpose of yours. We want to thank you this morning. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who have impressed upon each one of us, Lord, of your goodness and of your future for each one of us. Lord, there is nothing that could describe what is in our heart now, the gratitude 
of your love, your grace and your mercy. We just want to say thank you, Lord, before we leave here today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.